the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, tonight is marriage and holy orders. I'm going to do holy orders first, just so I can finish, then I'll leave. <laughs> I hear my bad calling. So anyway, all right. Um, so holy orders. What? Why do we call it orders? Because we promise obedience to the bishop? We do that, but that's not why it's called orders. Back in the Roman times, there were different groups of people were called an order. So there was, in the army, there was the order of centurions. And there was the order of senator in Rome. There was, so there were different groups of people grouped together. And that's why, that's where the name Holy Orders comes from. And we have three levels of Holy Orders. Anybody know what those three levels are? Bishop, priest, and deacon. Bishop, priest, and deacon. Okay? And in the books I was reading, they always started with the bishop at the top. But since we're humble people, we'll start at the bottom with deacon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? He blushing that thing. You got him blushing now. Oh, okay. <laughs> but anyway, so we start with Deacon. And that's the first level, if you want to say. The first order. The order of Diaconia. Deacon. And there's Two kinds of deacons. One is called permanent, deacon Joe. One is called transitional, that's me, because I was transitional going towards priesthood. And so, if you remember in the, in the Acts of the Apostles, the apostles were preaching, but they were also having to serve at tables. The widows of the Greeks weren't getting the same service as the widows of the Jewish Christians. And so there was complaints. Of course, nobody ever complains anymore at church or about the church. Yeah, right. Anyway, so they appointed seven men to be deacons to take care of the needs of these Greek widows. And so deacons, that is an order of service. So the first thing that we have in the order, holy orders, is to be of service. Now, when I get ordained a priest, do I put that deacon stuff behind? No. I'm still a deacon, and I try to remember that, and I try to be aware of service. At um, daily mass, after communion, when Deacon Joe's cleaning the vessel so we don't have any altar server, I'll go take the book off the altar, just because I know I should be of service and a deacon. Now, in the prayer, the, the bit, oh, first, all ordinations, all of these sacraments, the minister is always a bishop. Like in confirmation for adults, it's, I mean, confirmation for children, it's usually a bishop, but he can let, he can say, oh no, the priest can do that. But you can't do that with ordination. Come on in. So, a deacon, 
is called to be of service. And when the bishop prays over the deacon at his ordination, he says, may every gospel virtue abound, abound in him. They have all the gospel virtues. And then it continues with unfeigned love, concern for the sick and poor, unassuming authority, purity of innocence. You got that? Purity of innocence, Joe. And the observance of spiritual discipline. So that's what they pray for this deacon. And that's what they hope continue in priesthood and if they become a bishop, those same things. In the ceremony, one, the, well, the laying on of hands is the symbol of any ordination. And when we lay on hands, what are we calling down? Holy Spirit. Okay? You ever seen at Mass right before the consecration? The priest puts his hands over the gifts, calling down the Holy Spirit. This is the same type as laying on hands at you. So, but the other thing is at the deacon ordination, the bishop gives the one ordained a deacon, the book of the Gospels. Okay? And you see the deacon at Mass, if there's a deacon, he usually carries in the book of the Gospels in the opening procession on Sunday. And when he gives it, the bishop, he says to the deacon, believe what you read. Teach what you believe and practice what you teach. So that's sort of what they're trying to do, what he's instructing the deacon to do. And as I say, as a priest, I don't try I try not to forget those things. I try not to say, ah, oh, I'm a higher order, I don't I can't be a deacon anymore. So a deacon is about service. And one of the things in their training, they try to teach them that it's not about the serving at the altar is part of it, but it's not the main thing. It's how can we serve. And some deacons, they might be doing prison ministry, they might visit the sick, now, Deacon Joe is mostly just in the parish, but that's still visiting the sick. He's, he does a lot of things. In fact, he does more things than I know that he does. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. Um, so, a deacon is of service. That's what the word deacon means, servant. Then, the next level is priest. And a deacon, he's clergy, part of the clergy, but he's not in the priestly ministry. Oh, what are some of the things a deacon can do? He can preach. He can baptize. He can do funerals and weddings. He can, uh, what else can we do? Those are the things I can think of right off. There's probably a few more. But a deacon is called to be of service. Then the next level is presbyter. That's the official name. We say priest. But presbyter means elder. And in the early church, it was about the second century, late in the second century, before they started calling presbyters priests. But in the priestly ministry, I'm called a 
Okay, remember the sacraments. They're a symbol, but they bring about what they symbolize. Well, I'm now in the person of Christ. I'm a symbol of Christ, but actually I become another Christ. Okay, I'm not going to die on the cross, hopefully. The, but a priest, remember in the Old Testament, anybody remember what the priest did? They offered sacrifice. Well, I offer sacrifice. That's what the Mass is about, the sacrifice of Jesus. I'm offering Jesus. And so I'm called to become another Jesus. And some days I'm better at it than others. Okay? Some days I'd rather not be that. I just want to... Do what I want to do, right? But most of the time, I'm not too bad at it. So, a priest, in addition to what the deacon does, he offers Mass. He can um, anoint the sick. Deacons can visit the sick, but not anoint. And the reason is anointing has some element of the sacrament of reconciliation in it. And then he can do confessions. And in confession, in the anointing, in the Mass, I'm trying to do what Christ did. And all of us in baptism, we became part of the priesthood of all believers. Now, both marriage, which Joe will talk about, and holy orders are there for service to the community. In marriage, husband and wife they're in charge of what we call the domestic church. Every family is its own church. And then on Sundays with the Eucharist, we gather, it's a gathering of all the families into our church family. So husband, wife in charge of parents, they're in charge of the family. I'm in charge of the church family. And I'm called to be a pastor. Not all priests are pastors, but I'm called to be a pastor. A pastor, does anybody know what el buen pastor means in, from the Spanish? It means the good shepherd. So as a pastor, I'm called to be a shepherd. And so, being a shepherd, I'm back to what we were talking about deacons. I'm there to serve. It's not about me getting everybody to do what I want them to do. It's about assisting you to do what God wants you to do. Hopefully God and I agree, but they're not always the same. I'm human. So, as I say, the priest is called to offer the sacrifice, called to be in the person of Christ, in persona Christi. I'm called to be a sacrament in that way, to bring Christ to the world. As I said, in baptism, you became part of the priesthood of all believers. We anoint you to be priest, prophet, and king. Okay. Excuse me. But I'm doing better than when Morgan and uh, Will were meeting 
with me before I was sneezing and sneezing, so I'm not doing as bad, am I? Okay. So anyway, then the third level is the level of episcopoi or bishop. Episcopal. Not like Episcopal Church, but the epis episcopacy is means bishop. And the bishop does all the same things that the priest does, but he's the pastor of a whole diocese. Okay. He's and bishops along with the Pope are part of the magisterium. Anybody remember hearing that word? I've mentioned it before. And what's the magisterium? It's all the bishops together. But there, that's the teaching authority of the church. Okay. So he's part of the teaching authority. And then the bishop, he's the, he's the one that can ordain. He can, a bishop can't be, somebody can't be ordained a bishop unless another bishop does it. And usually, one can do it, but usually the church requires there to be three bishops present, or more. Okay? So they, the bishop, as I say, is teacher, pastor, head of a diocese, and his chair is called the cathedra, or cathedra. And where is it located? The cathedral. That's, and there's a special chair for the bishop. The chair I sit in at church, any priest can sit in that. But nobody better sit in the bishop's chair but the bishop. Okay? So, that's, in a nutshell, what Holy Orders is about. It starts with service, then it extends to being in, in the person of Christ, and then it comes in bishop joining the teaching authority of the church. Any questions, comments? Oh, the other thing, only men, as most of you know, only men are allowed. Because, now there are some debates about deacons, but there were, we think, we, in the scripture it seems as if Jesus only called the twelve to continue his ministry in that way. And so that's why we have an all-male priesthood. Okay, I got a question, you know me. The nuns aren't priests. I know they're not, but how they, they, they just give the vows in a religious order of um, poverty, chastity, and obedience. So that's all they can do then, so they don't have any authority whatsoever. They have no authority. But bishops and priests try to let them, let them think they have authority. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, you know, and many of them are learned and prayerful, so we should listen to them. Okay. How did you determine some you can listen to? What's that? I said some you can listen to, and some you don't really want to listen to that much. <laughs> okay, now. How do you know which priest will become bishops? How does that Okay, happen? how does somebody become a bishop? As I understand it, each bishop, each year, at the gathering of the bishops of a province, okay, so our province is the two dioceses in Alabama, the two dioceses 
in Mississippi. And one of the dioceses is considered the main diocese, so that's an archdiocese. And that bishop is an archbishop, so that's what Archbishop Brody is. Mm -hmm. And so my understanding is each year they each get some names and together they send them to Rome, I mean to the Apostolic Nuncio, who's the Pope's representative in Washington. Then he sent forwards those names to the um, what is it? Congregation of Bishops. They recommend, <coughs> and I don't know how exactly they do that to the Pope, but eventually it's the Pope who chooses. Okay. The, they do, if somebody's being considered, they do send a questionnaire to some people that might know them. And that person who gets the questionnaire can't say anything. But my friend got one and he told me about it. That's how I know it happened. <laughs> so, because it was somebody we both knew they were asking about. And so, Archbishop Brody the other day said that um, when the men are approached to be a bishop, at this point in time, around the world, like 30% ref refuse. So, they don't feel called to that. Okay. Archbishop Brody said at his time he felt like out of obedience, if they asked him, he had to say yes. Now some people have asked me, Father, you think you'll ever be a bishop? I said, Absolute, I absolutely know I won't. And they say, how can you be so sure? I said, I've said all the wrong things in all the right places. So I said, oh. okay. Any other questions? Okay. Where does the cardinal fit in? A cardinal is appointed by the Pope. But he doesn't fit into any of these categories. In fact, the Pope is the head of the bishops. He's the Bishop of Rome. A cardinal, though, those that are appointed cardinal that are under 80 years old, they're in the convocation to elect the next Pope. But anybody can be named a cardinal. Yeah, because what I was thinking of Cardinal Timothy Dolan. He's yeah, but I'm saying a cardinal doesn't even have to be a priest. Right, okay. And is that, is that kind of the same thing as a Monsignor also? A Monsignor is an honorary title. Got it. That's what Father Gallagher And somebody, you know, and I've always said, nah, if I don't ever want to be a Monsignor, because the only honor I want is when I die. If, if God says, St. Jim, come on in, that's how I do it. I mean, any honors here on earth, that to me, that my senior stuff shouldn't even be there for the church. Is that, now, there's another one, the pastoral victory. Is that the one that just helps? There's a... Um, Is that the one that just helps the priest? Parochial vicar. Parochial, parochial vicar, I'm sorry. That's, he's like... In the old days, they called that assistant pastor. Got it. He's helping the pastor. That, that clarifies. That's so Father Isaiah's a parochial okay. vicar. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But, I mean, anybody could be a cardinal. Okay. Now, I think it's been four or five hundred years since somebody's been a cardinal that wasn't a priest. Any other questions? The uh, bishop's ordained. Is he ordained in Rome or is he ordained in... No, he's ordained usually at the cathedral. 
in the diocese he's going to be bishop of. But okay, let's. Uh, oh, another thing. If a bishop gets appointed to another diocese, he's not reordained, he's installed because he's already a bishop. These, each of these three levels have what we call a character, an imprint, and you, it helps you become what you're being ordained for. Uh, one of the things I was looking at, he quoted somebody as saying for the priest, I am what I do, and I do what I am. So that's sort of what we're about. Any other questions? Okay, I'll let Deacon Joe take over. Feel better. I hope so. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Got to restart First question. <laughs> Don't look in my... Why not? <laughs> you, know, you can answer the question. I got it to you, not to ask God. How important or how integral is love to marriage? inside, you know, in your heart maybe, in your soul maybe, you know you have love when you dare to express it. And how often do we express that? You never know if it's going to come back or if it's just going to die out, okay? And you express it even though it may not be returned. You know you have love when a barrier develops in communication and understanding and it troubles you relentlessly. And then you try to break down those barriers to restore and let the warmth return to the relationship. Now, doesn't that sound like Hollywood? <laughs> you know, it's that, it's that romance, it's that entertainment romance that says, oh yeah, everything's gonna be fine and wonderful once you come together and say, oh, I'm so sorry this happened, but you know. And, and I think most couples really want to try and do that when it gets to that point, if it's important to them. And sometimes we equate this kind of love with a romantic impression of it. You know, there's always a romanticism or a romantic nature to that love. So that's what also helps us feel good about it. Feel that that person that we are in relationship with is sort of on the same wavelength, the same page as each one is. And then I came across this one. Love can change the world. Can it? Does it have the potential to? Possibly, sure. Love can change your life, okay? Did it? Sure does, doesn't it? Changes your life. But then it says, do what makes you happy. Now, in a relationship, in a marriage relationship, as an individual, as the husband or wife, do you always want to be the one to be happy? 
Hmm? Do you want to make the other person happy? Sometimes. Okay? And do what you know is right. And what is that? To do the right thing. That's, you know, I mean, that, that, that's always just do the right thing. And love with all your might before it's too late. And that came from uh, Mike Pindler. He's with the Moody Blues out of the titled song, My Song. And, and this one was real interesting too. It comes out of scripture. True love. Set me as a zeal upon your heart. Doesn't that just grab you? You know, it's like, here, I'm going to take your heart and just hold it next to me. And a seal upon your arm. And I can just imagine couples, the seal upon my arm is walking arm in arm, you know, being, being that sense. For love is strong as death. You know, it, it's equal. That's what they're saying here. Love is just as equal or as much as death. And longing is fierce as shoal. So, but the but the, the 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 writer here in Song of Psalms is saying is you know it, it's it's on fire. This love should be a fire. It should be a desire that each one each individual has because it says that arrows are arrows of fire, flames of the divine. We're united with with God. We're united with uh, Christ. Deep waters cannot quench love. Our rivers sweep it away. So if love is there, nothing should ever deter or come against it. Okay? Make sense? So matrimony. We talk about matrimony. And Father Jim mentioned that it is a sacrament of service. Why or how would it be called? Or why is it called a sacrament of service? In marriage, what does service mean? What? Sorry, that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. She's got a good answer. No. <laughs> good. Who do you serve in the sacrament of matrimony? She's no? serving your spouse. Absolutely, that's who you're serving. You're serving your spouse, but it's also in relation to service with with uh, the church and with Christ. In the case, as Father Jim mentioned, it is the one of the two sacraments of service, and not only is it of service to the spouse, to each other, but it's also dedicated to the salvation of others. In other words, you are Christ to one another, and you are trying to help your spouse get to eternity. That's part of the whole concept of marriage and salvation, and the concept of marriage. And this is really interesting because he talks about the intimacy of community of life, which really constitutes the whole state of marriage. And it was established by the Creator, as it says here from our catechism, and endowed by Him with its own proper laws. So there's a sense of proper essence or proper things that go on with, with, with marriage in terms of the Catholic Church, because God Himself is the author. And we see this in Scripture. This comes from Scripture as well. And especially at the very beginning in Genesis. God created us in His own image. And He created us male and female. He blessed us. Blessed us with the grace of that, that humanity that He wanted to share with us. And it's also that He wants us to be fertile and multiply. He just doesn't want us to be in and of ourselves. The whole idea between marriage and love is to be able to bring new life, new life to creation. And that's what he means here. And it was also, you know, when we look at it instituted by Christ, there's that integral integration of when he was at the wedding feast of Cana. Okay, he wasn't there to preside over the wedding, but he became an integral part of that whole uh, wedding that took place. And of course, through his own preaching, he taught that the union of, of a man and a woman should be permanent. We hear that throughout the Gospels, the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, you know, in terms of the permanency of marriage. And of course, death until death. How things in life happen, okay? Things in life happen. So, so that's the ideal. That, that is certainly, definitely the ideal. 
So as God is the author of marriage, certain values and purposes come with that in terms of marriage. There's personal development. And how would that personal development come about? What would that entail? as an individual, okay? You develop differently from the time you're a child, the teenager, to an adult. So what happens when it comes to the point of marriage? That personal development. Pretty much the same. Pretty much the same. Yeah, you're gonna, well, your personal development is still gonna continue, but guess what? You've got the continuance now with someone else. Someone else is gonna be there. And, and, and I don't know, I'm pretty old here too. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the differences happen. You know, people change, right? I, I would think that we all change somehow. And that's that personal development. We change in terms of our understanding of each other, the understanding of the spouse. Well, Hopefully the change is good. <laughs> Hopefully the change is good. Now, does Margaret really want me to change you? Yeah. Go on. <laughs> no, that, no. You know, that, that, that sometimes is a fallacy that... that you know, uh, a, a spouse will think that if they marry, that they can change that individual. Not so true. No, not so true. true. But I do think, though, if you leave it in front of them, it'll rub off. Well, hopefully. I mean, I'm talking about if, living a Christian life, mm -hmm. like getting up and going to church, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like you're not putting your hands around, you know, choking and saying, come on. But they'll see, <laughs> they'll see that it works, it works for you, and they might be missing something. Well, I didn't put that in the presentation, but that is a part of it. Mm -hmm. That as couples, you know, prayer, going to church, you know, that whole scenario of being spiritual is a part of the development in that relationship. That's like being another. an example. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And that whole continuation of humanity is to, to bring forth children. And as I mentioned earlier, you're there to help the other get to the eternal, right. eternal destiny. And this should also bring some kind of stability, maybe some peace or prosperity. And there's also that dignity within the family that it comes. Okay? Now, I think there'll be tough times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. And, and um, this, this comes from our, our catechism of the Catholic Church. The vocation to marriage is written in the very nature of man and woman. So we have that, that sense that we shouldn't be alone. And this comes also back from Genesis where God created man and woman because he shouldn't be alone. You know, remember the creation story where he created the animals but Adam could not find a suitable mate? So he created female. That's that's sort of the nature that that was in the, in the heart of man and woman. The marriage is not purely a human institution. We may think so, okay, because you can go down to the courthouse and get your piece of paper, a marriage license. So you think, well, okay, you know, that's that's the way it's going to be. That's the way it should be. But the institution really didn't come from the government. The institution of marriage came. From and it has, of course, it's undergone different uh, transitions over the centuries and how it's celebrated, who, is, who marries who and what cultures, and of course the social structures and spiritual attitudes also have changed over the course of time over the centuries. So, but the whole sense of the sacrament itself has stayed stable. Nothing has changed in terms of what the church teaches in terms of marriage, how it should be performed, and when and, when and how it should be celebrated. Okay? So in terms of the church, marriage is the sacrament, and we look at it from the perspective that it's between the baptized man and baptized woman. And it's through an exchange of vows. But through that exchange of vows, there's that love that is exchanged there, that is exclusive. It's exclusive to that couple, to them. I mean, yeah, you share the love, but it's a totally different kind of love. But, you know, it's also permanent. And that love becomes a sense of, you know, that sexual partnership. And it is a lawful marriage, okay? 
you know, you have to have that, that, that certificate, you have to have that um, uh, license now, or whatever it is from the state, but you also have to have that certificate from the church. So it is sort of legal and binding in a way. But the difference between just that civil kind of marriage and the marriage to the church is the grace that is bestowed to the couple through the sacrament. And I know, again, grace is not something you see, feel, touch, but it is there, it is, and, and it comes through. And of course, by its nature, it's always ordered toward the good, the good of the couple, the good of the family, the good of the spouses, and that, that through that, the procreation of bringing children in is also to be their educator bring them up into the faith as well. And those of you who have gone through Catholic marriages, um, we have what we call a prenuptial investigation. And one of the questions that comes in there is, are you open to having children? And are you going to bring the children up in the faith if it's a mixed marriage? Okay, so that, that's an important aspect of Catholic marriage. And another aspect of the uh, Catholic marriage is covenant. And it's a covenant by which a man and woman establish themselves in partnership for the whole of life. Now why do we call it a covenant? Why would it be called a covenant? How many covenants were in the scripture? That's where we really get it from, is the covenant begins with God and his people. So the covenant is the relationship between a man and a woman, in this case. But it's God's covenant. We go all the way back to Israel, where God made the covenant with Israel, and it becomes in the, in the image. It becomes the image of the faithful married, the two spouses who married together. That's the idea of covenant. And also through other books in the Bible, through Ruth and Tobit, they elevated you know, the sense of marriage, the sacrament of marriage, as a sense of fidelity and tenderness. And that's, isn't that shared? Isn't that sometimes shared? You know, in different ways. It doesn't necessarily mean the hugs and the kisses, but it could be how someone may be, oh, I'll, I'll cook a meal for you. I'll take you out to dinner. You're tired. I'll take care of something for you. I'll <laughs> do the dishes. <laughs> yeah, I know you're. I know you're. You're gonna do them in the dishwasher. That's what I do. He cooks too. I'm not. But 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 there's also the thing that that the couples are partner with God. You know, partner with His creation, because as I mentioned earlier, we are created by God in His image and in his goodness. And we also want to establish that spiritual partnership. There's that spiritual partnership that as individuals, we take that partnership to, to God and to Christ. But in marriage, we want to make that whole partnership between the, the husband and wife and God. And through this sacrament, and this is sometimes a tough one for, for folks, it establishes an indissolvable bond the church says it should be permanent, that it's a forever thing until death. And of course, there's things in life that happen that maybe aren't in our control, that sometimes things don't work out the way that they have planned. And so we're going to talk about that process next class. Okay? Because I know some of you in here are divorced and are going through a normal process. So we're going to talk about that next class. Okay. <clears throat> And again, as I mentioned earlier, it's a partnership for the whole of life, a covenant. God made a covenant with his people. Did he ever fall or say, oh, I'm not going to stick around with you people, I'm going to find somebody else. No, he stuck with the people, no matter what. So we were the ones that fell away. So <clears throat> the church, did, you know, I put in here, it's not a civil contract. There's a difference between what we call the covenant and the contract, right? Okay, um, I gotta bring this up because I thought about this earlier today. Is my wife likes to watch like NCIS, CIS, and uh, she's watching 
the FBI last night. And it kind of struck me between, uh, there's a man and a woman, they're, they're partners in the FBI, the two FBI agents, and supposedly somewhere along the way they had a relationship, she got pregnant, okay? Or married, she's pregnant. But she came to him and said, we got to talk, okay? And right away he's thinking, okay, he's going to propose that they get married. No. But she did. She went to a lawyer and had a contract, an agreement signed up that she wanted him to sign. She wanted sole authority for her child. In other words, she wanted to exclude him from having any kind of relationship with the baby. And I was like, wait a minute. You know, you know didn't mean sign a contract. I mean, but that's kind of what, it just struck me that someone would go to that extent in terms of writing up a contract to say, no, 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 you're not going to be part of this. So, you know, well, you decided not to sign the contract, so. But again, you know, looking back at covenant, when we talk about covenant as opposed to contract, covenant is permanent. It's, it's something that you want to stick with. Contract, if, if, it's a, if it's a contract, you can get out of the contract. You can pay a penalty. Or if it's a contract, the contract says it's going to end at such and such a time. Covenant doesn't. And why is that? Because, well, the way that we look at covenant is you have three people involved. It's just not between the husband and the wife. It's also between Jesus. So it forms sort of that triangle, a trinity. You know, you know when you look at the trinity, you know, you have the husband and the wife, and then you have Jesus, the Holy Spirit. And the relationship in terms of a covenant, when we looked at, uh, at it from a standpoint of God and his people, he made that relationship with them. He instituted that covenant. And he always promised that he was going to stay faithful to the people regardless of what they did. And look what happened in the Exodus story. How many times? How many times did people grumble and, and turn away from God? And, and, and even in even in other Old Testament uh, books, how many times did they go and worship the pagan gods? And God still uh, ended, ended up another 40 years. Get rid of that, gener get rid of that generation. Maybe I can have better luck with the next one. Um, but in, in, in part of that covenant was that the people also promised that they would be faithful to God. And that wasn't always the way it was. And so when we look at this, this, this whole sense of covenant relationship, and how it is to be celebrated, it's always going to be in a liturgical act. It's always going to be liturgical. So remember from previous classes, liturgical is our public worship. So publicly, we're also committing ourselves in front of the community that this is what we're going to do. This is, this is my um, essence to the people of this community, that we are husband and wife, and we're going to do what it takes to be faithful and live out that, that covenant. Any questions or comments so far? Okay. And the whole part of this whole thing about marriage in the Catholic Church is its relationship in terms of Christ's love for the church. That's also part of the marriage in terms of where the sacrament looks at. The couple's witness Christ's spousal love for the church. So the union of husband and his wife is kind of equates to the love that Christ had for his church. Okay? And St. Paul, St. Paul also has in Ephesians, he called it a mystery, this whole uh, sense of the union of marriage to Christ's love for the church as a mystery. But the Christian marriage is a sign of Christ's love as well. So it's just not necessary, not necessarily just bringing the love between the two of you. That love should also incorporate Christ within it. And so your love also mirrors the love Christ has for his church. Okay? So that's kind of, you know, it's like a threefold thing. Faithful to your uh, spouse, but you're also committed in terms of faith within the, the church itself. And, um, and hopefully, hopefully by the mutual consent, mutual fidelity that is present with the love of Christ, 
will lead each other to uh, greater holiness. Uh, my wife, every once in a while, reminds me, reminds me, because she remembers it, I don't, but the priest that married us said somewhere along the way that she is to be Christ to me, and I am to be Christ to her. And that's what that call to greater holiness is. As you're, you know, the, the couples are, the husband and the wife are Christ for one another as well. Just like Father Jim is Christ for the people of the church, the pastor. So we are Christ to one another as well. And it, it's by nature, again, it's by nature, by God's nature, that it is towards the good of the spouses. Oh, you're done? Okay. Well, you know, we had like five kids. Okay. <laughs> Four right. kids. It's like... Okay. Anybody who doesn't notice my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so, before I got interrupted here, right, so couples, couples minister each other. That's that's the part of that marriage, you know, the exchange of vows. The ministers of the, of the, uh, the sacrament of marriage are the spouses. The priest is just there to witness it. Okay? The priest is just a witness. <laughs> And Father Tim mentioned about the, um, the domestic church, where the families the domestic church. And that's where the bringing up of children uh, take place. It's to celebrate as well Christ's love in context of their family life. Bringing children into the world to also bring them up in the, in the faith. So when we come to church, we celebrate that whole sense of the family as a, as a small community, but also bringing it together in the larger community. And here, I came across two things that, that said, when I added a third, two truths about marriage. Marriage is bringing in new life, right? But marriage celebrates and enhances the love between the husband and wife. And that's the commitment. That's the love we're talking about in the beginning. And that love can take on different forms, different ways of expression, right? Okay? So it just doesn't mean it's always the happy-go-lucky, warm and fuzzies, right? But the essence, in terms of the marriage, is not the wedding day. That's only one day in the life of the marriage. Marriage is for the lifetime. So people, and, and I know, it's, it's, it's part of the culture, part of the society, and, that we want to make it a celebration, and that's wonderful. We need to celebrate that union. We need to celebrate and be conscious of that. Share that joy, share that goodness with the family, with friends, with, with whoever is invited. But that is only one day out of the life of the married couple, okay? And what, in the vocation, there's also a vocation in terms of marriage, is it's a very nature men and women through the infinite love of God that he gives us this vocation, okay? Just as the priesthood and religious life is a vocation, marriage is a vocation. But when we talked about it earlier that marriage is sort of the, the nature of the man and the woman, not everybody is called to marriage, correct? Not everybody gets that call. You know, priests and those who go to religious life. There are those who do not even go to religious life or become priests or sisters that choose celibacy. They stay single. And that's your choice. That's, again, a vocation that they, that they feel that God is calling to. But couples most, mostly are joined in life's journey. Right? It's a journey. I don't know. Right? I mean, you're starting out on a journey, sort of. You know, Margaret and Robert, and then on that journey for a while. I've been on that journey for a while. You know, but, but again, it, it, it's just not something that, that is stagnant, okay? Marriage is a constant evolving sort of, of life. And all, all the things that come along, the joys, the sorrows, you know, so those are the things that if we don't have that sense of Christ's love, 
you know, that 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 doesn't hold hold couples together sometimes. So couples are in creation, partnership with God in creation. And there's that spiritual partnership also that I talked about earlier. The sharing of the faith, the sharing of prayers, the sharing of uh, uh, going to Sunday <coughs> service or worship, mass. It's all those that take into consideration that spiritual partnership that enhances the relationship as well. It enhances the love each one has for the other. Okay? And of course, marriage requires free consent. We'll talk about that in a little bit right now. And um, there's, there's also, and again, you know, sometimes people think, well, the Catholic Church just, you know, you just can't go and get married, right? And, and there's reasons why the Catholic Church does what it does. It has certain requirements and there's a certain amount of preparation that goes into it. And hopefully it's to enhance the couple in terms of developing their relationship so they know long term what it's going to take to, to carry it through. So one of the requirements is couples need to be mature, right? That's why the church doesn't allow anybody 18 or, or younger to be married without the consent of the parents. There's a certain maturity level that it may not be there. And maturity level may not be there until they're in the mid-twenties, okay? They have to be unmarried. And, of course, not related to blood. <laughs> can't marry your first cousin, you can't marry him, okay? <laughs> so, and uh, free consent, you have to be consent to it freely. And that free consent means there's no constraints. No constraints in terms of somebody coercing someone to get married, forcing someone to be, to be married, and that there be no impediments, either from a natural standpoint or from a legal standpoint. Now, what could that mean from a natural standpoint? Okay? If you can't consummate the marriage, that's an impediment to marriage. Okay? Doesn't necessarily mean that, that it cannot happen because there's also avenues in which the couple can go and adopt. But they still have to consummate the marriage to be it's a requirement by the church. And legally, you can't be, you know, uh, uh, have a, um, I don't want to say a criminal record, but in terms of having any legal action against you. And these are questions that come up in the investigation. Um, exchange of vows happens, as I mentioned before, the priest and the two witnesses. Two witnesses have to be present. And of course, we do ask couples to do a certain amount of marriage prep, marriage preparation. We have retreats called Engaged Encounter. We have workshops. Now, we don't have necessarily here in our parish, we don't have what we call marriage mentors. So it's a couple that gets involved with the engaged couple, and they sit down for a session, kind of dialogue between what marriage is about, what challenges and what struggles that they have to go through. And there's other instructions. We use something called um, Focus, Inc. 